hearing, no. I'm hearing quite some echo from your side. Uh, How about um, now? It's now it's better. I was hearing my own voice, but this is good now. Okay, I hope it's good. Okay, so thank you for your time, and I'll ask you a few questions. I read about uh, Taiwan's reaction to COVID nineteen and your work, so I'll ask you a few questions about that. Um, so first of all, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about masks. I know you had a problem of shortage of masks in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, it was in February pandemic. and March. Yes. Yeah, and in some point you decided to release to to people to the public uh, the data about the inventory of the masks all mm -hmm. over Taiwan. Yeah, the real time API. Yes. Yeah. So I guess any normal government would just create a map themselves. Uh -huh. But you decided to release it to the to the public. Mm -hmm. Not. What, why did you do that? Why did you? Why do you think it's better to give the well, public information? Because people have different preferences, right? The civic tech people who originates the idea of ma uh, maps is one slide, but there are also people who are more elderly that would prefer a chatbot, or people who have seeing difficulties that would prefer a voice assistant. Not to mention the twenty different national languages. It's just impossible for the government to deliver more than one hundred different kind of services uh, for all the kind of people. So if we open up the API for each person that says, hey, what you have provided is not accessible or inclusive enough, we can say, hey, here is the source code and API. Go ahead and, and do your own version, and we will include it in our portal. So I personally coded up this portal that lists more than 140 now uh, different applications using that API because it, it was not possible for us to be all things to all people, but people can be all things to all people people. Yeah, so the government cannot uh, create all the solutions, but if you give the data to other people, they can create uh, a lot more solutions than that. That's right. That's right. So uh, there's no like reference implementation, if that's what you're asking about. Because mm -hmm. uh, if we uh, do a reference implementation and it's updated uh, in its data more regularly than the citizens' version, then of course everybody will use the official version, and then people who feel excluded will still feel excluded. But by having essentially the official version just be a portal to whatever need uh, that you want and co-create it with the uh, community, uh, then people won't be locked locked in to particular imagination and people who want to uh, do, you know, chatbots and voice assistants wouldn't be limited uh, to the map uh, developers imagination on the same API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Uh, another thing that you do in Taiwan or uh, is to use the, the uh, cell phone location data. Yeah, it's for, the uh, cell phone signal strength. Yeah, cell phone signal strength. Uh, to just check if people are staying in the quarantine. That's right. But we don't use uh, contact tracing or other GPS uh, apps like other countries. Like yeah, our, our, our contact tracing apps are, are human. <laughs> They're uh, medical officers that perform the interviews uh, and such. Uh, so it, it's not a application now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, do you think if if things were getting more serious in Taiwan, uh, there were more people infected, you would stop, wanted to stop the epidemic, will you uh, consider using something like contact tracing? Or where, where do you think the line stands between fighting the epidemic and keeping well, people privacy? Right. You, you see, the, uh, the reason why we use cell phone strands is that um, it's already used before the pandemic. Right, we used it for earthquake warnings, for um, sending SMS to people to uh, evacuate from a flood, a uh, potential vulnerable place uh, when a typhoon hits, and so on. The whole point of reusing that geofenced uh, technology with SMS only is because people understand the perimeter, people understand um, the properties uh, of it. People would not uh, fear that their chat log or their SMS messages will be read. Uh, by the SMS sending cell phone towers because they understand that's not how it works because we've been having that for, for years, if not decades. So um, the ideas of appropriate technology is that we make sure that people work with technology that they're already familiar with. So even if uh, 
the pandemic uh, becomes more serious in Taiwan, we will do whatever we can to reuse components that are already tried and trusted instead of writing new code. This is not about uh, cybersecurity for cybersecurity alone. This is about the social trust of the mechanisms that were already in place and therefore trust more. Mm -hmm. So not sure you will use contact tracing because this not, this is not something you did you didn't use before, so you will not introduce no, new we, tools. We use contact tracing that is interviews, right? Mm -hmm. And we do use, as you said, uh, the cell phone tower strengths, uh, the triangulation, and that's because the data is being collected anyway. Right. Uh, we we don't collect new data in the form of an app or a Bluetooth dongle or things like that because that would be new data collected. Uh, but uh, it, as long as you turn on your cell phone, the cell phone towers already know your rough whereabouts anyway, um, and so there's no new data collection, therefore no new uh, privacy or cybersecurity threat surface. Uh, so to speak, and that's the important part. We will, of course, do whatever we can to fight the pandemic, but the important thing is that we don't see it as a zero-sum trade-off that you can uh, give up some human right or some sort of democracy uh, to fight the pandemic. We need to keep exactly the same line because we've never declared uh, emergency state, uh, and so we operate firmly within the constitutional limit. Every single administrative action we do must be pre-approved by the parliament explained uh, to the MPs and therefore there was no lockdowns uh, entire year in Taiwan and even if there uh, is community spread in the future, we'll just do a um, kind of very small district level lockdown uh, to make sure that it doesn't spread. Uh, but mostly we rely on you know, hand sanitation mask use to keep the R0 value under one. So the community transmission will never become a community spread if more than three quarter of people wear their mask and wash their hands. Yeah, it's funny. I have a friend who lives in Taiwan and he said uh, one day in the future when everybody talks about the, the quarantine experience that they had, he will not have any stories because Taiwan is one of the only countries that didn't use this. So, <laughs> That's yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, I, I heard you said that one of the success, one of the secrets of Taiwan's mm -hmm. success is listening to the citizens. Mm -hmm in mm -hmm. some way the government listens mm -hmm. so maybe you can say a little bit about what kind of feedback from the public did you get the government and how did you maybe incorporate it how mm -hmm. did you use that the, this feedback or change things mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the mask availability map, for example, when we first uh, introduced the um, idea of mask rationing, it was 6,000 pharmacists uh, trusted by the community having professional credentials doing the rationing. And the mask map was designed as something to save their time, right? Because people don't have to run to four different pharmacies uh, only to find the first three have run out of masks. That, that was the idea, uh, but uh, it was the, the ideal. Uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> the, the first day we get um, literally hundreds of angry pharmacists messages uh, through the feedback form and calling the 1922 uh, toll free number saying that this so-called time saving device actually wastes everybody's time because um, as opposed to what we thought, which is people would use their national health insurance card uh, to swipe it and collect the mask and therefore the map numbers goes down in real time. Many pharmacists mm -hmm. choose to uh, just take the NHI cards and give them numbered plates. Uh, and tell them to collect the mask at the evening. So, and then they will swipe the NH card slowly during the day um, and as to, you know, um, not make the queue so long, right? So you basically, you visit the pharmacy twice. Once to get your NHI card there in exchange to a plate, and at the evening you get your NHI card back and then hand back the plate. And many pharmacists do that. But when they do that, uh, they may run out of the mask quota of the day by 10 a.m. But on the mask availability map, it will go very, very slowly and only runs out maybe at 1 p.m. or something because they were, you know, handling the cart uh, without the um, people right in it. And so everybody who visits uh, those pharmacists uh, will see um, a, a very large uh, mismatch between what's on their app uh, and what's really in the pharmacies. And many pharmacies at the first week write very large words, uh, paintings even in the front door that says, don't trust the app. Uh, and, right, uh, and, and so it, it was not it was not a overnight 
success. Um, we work with pharmacists uh, in weekly iterations, literally changing uh, the app, the data structure, and uh, working with all the map designers and so on, uh, and changed every week. And it only stabilized maybe three weeks later uh, because of the feedback that's co-created by the pharmacist. So uh, the opening hours uh, will become additional notes uh, on the map is featured prominently that says collect back at evenings when they run out of stock they can eventually press a key to disappear from the map I can go on uh, but this is a really a co-creation journey this is not some like magically good idea that works on the first try this is like us literally looking at the feedbacks and the call centers people and working with initially angry um, pharmacists uh, to make sure that we did end up saving their time uh, by early March Mm. But but you yeah, still operate this uh, 1922 hotline? Is it still available now? Or yes, yes, stopped? anyone can call it. Uh, there's more than 90% yeah. chance that it will be immediately picked up. And you can get mm -hmm. all your questions answered and make suggestions like the pink mask thing that you probably have yeah. heard already. Uh, and, and that continues to operate now. Mm. Even though there was no new effect infections for a long time in Taiwan, right, right, right. So. And, and because people worry about the, the rest of the world, also, right? Uh, and so uh, mm. there's also overseas visitors, right? We just had a 90 uh, people delegation from the Czech Republic, um, and where the head of the Senate visited and and say that uh, in the spirit of Ich bin eine Berliner, he said I am Taiwanese, we should have one, right? <laughs> but uh, because of the visits from the US, from Japan, from Czech Republic, um, and, and more in the future, people also want to know like what's the, the procedure of keeping uh, the visitors uh, from the public transports? How is the Foreign Service uh, making sure that everybody properly wears the mask, especially the journalist that comes uh, with the visitors and so on? So yeah. there's there's endless uh, you know question to ask of 1922 and make suggestions to. Yeah. But and and the daily press conference, you don't do that anymore. Or it's now weekly. Still... It's, it's weekly now. Oh, but it's still it's still going on. It, it, just it still weekly. goes on. Okay. It goes on. And if there's new developments and things like that, uh, we uh, just uh, have a press conference that day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, so you know, uh, another thing that is very crucial is a trust between the government and citizen to fight COVID nineteen. Um, in some countries, maybe Israel included, the, the, the government lost a lot of the public trust because of uh, faulty steps. So what, what do you think is like the secret or what steps should the government do in order to, to restore this trust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think the, the citizens may or may not trust the government. I, I don't really think the citizens should trust the government, really. I think the government should trust its citizens. Uh, the government should make itself transparent to the citizens and not make the citizens transparent to the government. That's why we insist on new, new data collection is a no-no when we uh, do the constitutional uh, review of the uh, counter uh, disease plan. We basically reuse existing data collection under uh, our GDPR um, hopefully adequate soon uh, data pri privacy uh, protection law uh, and so this is important because then people feel that um, they have a say uh, can set the agenda will be responded in the here and now or at least uh, next Thursday uh, and and that builds trust by showing our trust to the citizen it's like the Pygmalion effect right uh, so for example when a um, MP uh, the name is An Gao, uh, uh, Gao Hong An, uh, who uh, basically uh, questioned uh, in a uh, parliamentary interpolation uh, our uh, minister Chen Shi Zhong um, about the uh, mask availability distribution unevenness right and things like that uh, because she was a, a VP of data analytics at, at Foxconn um, and um, she used this um, civic technologies built map called Jiu Ping An that shows that even though it looks like it's spread very evenly uh, from a city to city viewpoint actually if you are uh, elderly or taking public transportation in the more rural places although the distance looks the same it would take you actually a lot more hours uh, to get mm -hmm. to the nearby pharmacy so the uh, algorithm that we use uh, was biased because not everybody fly helicopters, you see. Uh, and so because of that, um, and uh, interpolation uh, went really well because Minister Chen, who enjoyed great popularity, did not even for a second 
defend our existing policy. Rather, he remarked, legislator teach us uh, and then immediately revised the system. And so the day after working with um, Ms. Gao, the MP posted, quote, in the wake of yesterday's questioning is today's improvement, unquote. So the more trust the government has in its citizens, including parliamentarians, the more trustworthy citizens become. Mm, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to know, I know that you were involved in the Sunflower uh, movement in 2014. Uh, do you think uh, maybe the, this uh, Taiwan's reaction to COVID-19 was, uh, was influenced by this movement? You know, if this uh, protest was not happening in 2014, you think Taiwan will react differently? Things well, are... uh, to be perfectly honest, I think the more influential event <clears throat> is the SARS uh, pandemic, uh, well, mm -hmm. epidemic, not pandemic, epidemic uh, back in 2003. Uh, because in Taiwan, we had to lock down an entire hospital unannounced with no fixed state of ending the mm -hmm. lockdown. Uh, that led to like 37 people directly dead because of this, 73 cool. indirectly. At least one nurse tried to jump out of that hospital. It was very traumatic for everybody over 30 years old. Uh, and because of that, we have a natural aversion to lockdowns. So when the rest of the world look at the first epicenter, Wuhan, uh, and because they did a lockdown, right? Uh, and so people were like, oh, lockdown is how we counter the virus. We're like, no, we tried that in a helping hospital. It, although it may work, it's very traumatic. We're not going to do that. Uh, and, and so uh, that is uh, kind of uh, what really influenced. That said, I think the sunflower showed that uh, even through video conference only, live streaming only, uh, telepresence only, uh, people can still get uh, a useful rough consensus on things so it doesn't uh, you know it doesn't matter if people are in the most rural places the offshore islands the highest mountains and so on because we have broadband as a human right everybody have a equal stake a equal say uh, in the uh, public policies that concerns us all at a time it was a trade agreement so I would say that the demonstration back at time serves as a, a demo right it, it makes the government easier to trust the citizens because the citizens at the time did produce something useful for example asking the government to to ban PRC component from our then new 4G network, right? The, the clean mm -hmm. network thing uh, that I'm sure that the rest of the world is now slowly catching up to. Uh, but uh, that was a useful consensus from the street with very compelling argument that was eventually adopted uh, by the government. So uh, this trusting the citizen is easier uh, when there is precedent of things actually working that way. Uh, but I think the traumatic SARS experience is still the more important mm -hmm. one. But, but the sunflower movement in some way they created the government, caused the government to trust the citizens more? Exactly, yeah. yes. Yes, because it shows that uh, these are not violent mobs, right? Not only they clean the street uh, and the 20 NGOs having very orderly, useful deliberations. Uh, at the end, it was also a night market. And anyway, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, demonstration of nonviolent communication. And I uh, stress the nonviolent part. So after that, the mayors that uh, says, OK, we want to run open government, listening and skill and so on did get elected, uh, sometimes surprisingly to themselves. And the mayors that uh, used the traditional top-down way of policy making as their platform lose their elections. And that changed the political culture in Taiwan. Mm, very interesting, yeah. Uh, another thing that impressed me when I read about it is the human versus rumor strategy mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was uh, in order to, to respond to fake news or conspiracy mm -hmm. theories about mm -hmm. the coronavirus. But the mm -hmm. most, the thing that surprised me the most is the speed. You mm -hmm. say that sometimes the government, uh, the the um, government offices, they react in in a matter of two hours. That's right. The room. Yes, and that's maximum. Average is about one hour. One hour, they create any. They they see like fake news running in the internet, and then they decided to react. So that's really really fast. How do you do it so fast? You know, government uh -huh. offices traditionally are very, very slow in That's reality. Right. That's right. So um, you're, you're are a journalist, uh, so you can yeah. use the, the F word um, in conjunction with news. I'm not a journalist, though. I will say disinformation. Uh, and that's because in, in Mandarin, uh, journalism is literally news work. 
so there is no way to say, quote, fake news, unquote, without offending journalists uh, in Mandarin. Uh, and both my parents are journalists. So out of filial piety, I cannot use the F word. So disinformation in Taiwan and misinformation, um, we managed to counter it with no takedown. Uh, and the idea is that administrative takedown, much like administrative lockdown, uh, one for the infodemic, one for the pandemic, right? Uh, it, it's very similar, right? It, it may offer some, um, like on the surface, solutions to the to the epidemiologically affected people, uh, wh whether it's virus of the mind or virus of the body, uh, but it, it doesn't educate people. There is no vaccination. The lockdown is not a substitute for vaccination, uh, and the takedown is no substitute to clarifications that are funny. Because when people laughed about something, they cannot mm -hmm. feel outrage about the same thing anymore. They are mutually exclusive in our minds. And so we have professional comedians uh, in the ministries. We have uh, what I nickname hashtag officers, but the actual name is participation officers uh, in each ministry. For example, the participation office in the Ministry of Health and Welfare literally lives with a dog, a Shiba Inu. So whenever the, there's a new dog meme that needs to be produced, they just take a photo of the dog, of the competing animal, uh, and then roll out those funny memes. And so it means that the, the, it needs to be pre-cleared to a very high level that these timely responses doesn't need like five levels of uh, approval within the bureaucracy. Um, all the FAQs, frequently answered questions, materials are already there. Uh, and um, the ministries, including the premier, who literally made himself the butt of the joke, uh, pre-clear those images for use for comedians and so on. So they do not need to seek additional approval. And so we rely on people, even on end-to-end -end encrypted channels, which of course the state cannot see people can volunteer like flagging something as spam right long press something in the line uh, it's a name of a end-to-end you know, -end encrypted communication system if you long press it and flag it as spam then eventually it goes into a dashboard for the international fact checked network members uh, to fact check and so we know what's going to trend as a rumor on public social media long before it actually goes viral on the social media when it was just A-B testing on the end-to-end -end encrypted channels with no state surveillance, but rather relying on people to voluntarily report uh, mm. them. So that is like an early warning system. Mm. Okay. That's very impressive to do it because a lot of governments use humor, but sometimes they will publish the, the, the reaction like a day, two days, a week after that. So okay, that's... Then, it, then it doesn't work, right? Uh, yeah. be, because vaccination only works uh, before you develop symptoms. Uh, right. uh, and, and later than that, uh, of course, that is the, the pharmacology work. Uh, and of course, we have that too, right? We would invite people who are uh, most vocal opposing some of the government's policies into co-creation, basically asking the people who complain the loudest to be co-creators of policies. That works too, uh, but it takes more time uh, and is uh, far more time consuming. Easier would be just to vaccinate so people don't travel uh, their, Im uh, their imageries uh, outrage and can just discuss the meta in the, the book part of Facebook, not the face part of Facebook. Okay, yeah. Um, so basically the Taiwan government doesn't ask Facebook to take down a lot of stuff. But we, uh, we do a notice and public notice. Like if mm -hmm. there is a trending rumor that says, for example, and I quote, uh, it's a real one before our election, I think last November, uh, mm -hmm. and I quote, um, Hong Kong mobs are paying teenagers $200,000 to murder police, unquote, uh, and with a photo uh, of young people in the protest looking, uh, I don't know, young, uh, but it, it's a Reuters photo, by the way, uh, but the yeah. caption is a uh, cyber information warfare. The original caption says nothing about being paid uh, or things like murdering police, uh, but a new caption uh, says that this teenager is being paid so that he can buy new iPhones and recruiting his younger brother uh, and things like that. So instead of an administrative takedown, 
the international fact check network very quickly traced first is the Reuters photo, uh, right? And the miscaption actually original came from Zhongyang Zheng Fawei, the central political and law unit of the Chinese Communist Party in the People's Republic of China regime. That is to say, it is state propaganda. Uh, it, it came from their Weibo account. Uh, and because of that, instead of taking anything down, we basically just asked Facebook to show a prominent notice whenever anyone shares that story, it will say, basically, this is probably sponsored by the Chinese Communist Party. Well, it doesn't quite say that, but you get the idea. Like the, the frame of the story uh, changes because of the notice and public notice. Because if you take it down, people lose the uh, chance to learn that there is something like this uh, propaganda going on. But if you frame it as the propaganda as it is, uh, and stay sponsored at that, then people understand that, oh, someone is trying to change our outlook on Hong Kong, maybe because it's the most important uh, topic in our presidential election. Yeah. One last question before we... Um, I know that you worked after the Sunflower Movement, uh, V Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, you worked on this mm -hmm. uh, to create collective uh, dialogue between yes. people. And that uh, created some laws in Taiwan about selling alcohol online or that's right. that uh -huh. lead. Yeah, that well, was before, before my ministerial position. Nowadays, yeah. V Taiwan is still carried on by the social sector. Uh, and they are now, I think, deliberating how to open up the parliament, not just the administration, but the parliament, which is great. But I don't run V Taiwan anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, we use what we learned from V Taiwan, like the Polis AI conversation and so on, into the join.gov.tw platform, which has more than half of the population as visitors. Uh, and um, V Taiwan initially talked about this digital economy issues only, uh, but on uh, the POTUS use in the joint platform, we talk about things uh, like what's our ocean policy, what's our mountain policy. It's even mm -hmm. used uh, with the de facto U.S. Embassy, the AIT, on the digital dialogues about uh, trade relationship, military col collaboration, people-to-people -people ties, and things like that on the diplomatic front. Uh, and so my main work now is on the joint uh, platform, but uh, they share the, the same uh, methodology, which is get people a safe space to reflect on each other's feelings before jumping from the facts all the way to interpretations. Because if you jump to the interpretations, it may look like our position is very diverged, but actually they come from the same shared feeling, the same shared value. So with the shared value, there may be innovations that they can take care of both our positions. Like the joint platform has been used, uh, for example, to uh, solicit feedback on marriage equality, uh, which is a hotly debated topic back at the time uh, in, in Taiwan. And at the end, our regulation, um, our law, law actually, is nicknamed the Hyperlink Act, uh, legalized for same-sex couples, all the bylaws, the rights and duties, but none of the in-laws. That is to say, they wed as individual, but their families don't wed. Uh, the heterosexual couples, their families wed. Uh, and their individuals wed, but for same-sex couples, only the individuals wed, but not their families. And that is the kind of innovation that gets much more support from all the different generations, uh, because it protects the family value for all the different stakeholders, even though their position may look very different, but they mm -hmm. all respect family values, otherwise they would not go to marriage. So this is very good in creating a consensus between something that looks like opposition sides, but they, they find the common ground anyway. Exactly, yeah? yes. Yeah. Mm, okay. The, the, jo the joint platform, I mean, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was a prototype and researched in V Taiwan, yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for, very much for your time. Xie xie. Xie xie. Xie. <laughs> yes, so uh, would you like uh, me to embargo the publication of our conversation after you write your report? Yeah, yeah. this is uh, very course. important. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. So, so we'll, I'll let you know after we uh, publish the magazine okay. uh, interview and then you can just uh, use the video, okay? okay? Okay, so I'll put it on YouTube as unlisted uh, and that's it. And then I will wait for you uh, to tell me when to publish. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>